there's a scene I've loved since I was a teenager that has never left me. It's when Mace Windu fights a super battle droid army with his bare fists in Gendi Tartakovsky's Clone Wars. I love it because although Mace feels in control, he has to be sure of his movement in order to survive. There's one moment after using the force in every conceivable way to wipe out these droids, he pauses and dismantles one in a deliberate motion. When I was younger, I connected to the moment, at the time thinking it was due to the inventive nature of his takedown, but watching it again as an adult, I realized it was the beats of that moment that I really connected to. Essentially, the timing of the action. Chuck Jones once said, the discipline of filmmaking is, is and must be timing. There's no way that anything can work unless the timing is exact. Animation is, by its very nature, a series of images played one after the other at a specific speed, like 24 frames or pictures a second, until our brain can no longer separate them as images and we see them as a fluid motion. Now I know it's redundant to explain this, but today I feel it's important to start with this basic idea. Because how these images are then timed and spaced is vital for selling the animation as a believable story. We could go into a more technical description of timing and spacing images, but I really want to move away from this for today. Instead, I'd like to focus on the concept of readability. In order for animation to function, we have to be able to understand exactly what's being presented to us. And although animators can place layers of subtext within their work, the overall text itself has to be clear. The filmmaker's ideas have to be accurately presented to us. We, as an audience, have to be able to read it. In Hallis and Whitaker's book, Timing for Animation, they divide readability into two key factors. A. Good staging and layout so that each scene and important action is presented in the clearest and most effective way. And B. Good timing, so that enough time is spent preparing the audience for something to happen. Previously I've looked at both characters and backgrounds, where the background is often used to draw attention to the character, and then the character's emotions and movements can be easily identified by the audience, so they can follow your story. Hannes and Whitaker's second principle of timing I would emphasize is how to use the character's movement, or even in both anticipation and the action that then occurs, how the scene is paced. I can't emphasize enough that Gendy Tartakovsky's body of work stands by these principles and experiments in pushing them to an edge that has redefined old standards in animation. And I think he does this in three precise ways. The first one is he builds anticipation. You know, so many animated shows on TV are so talk heavy. Something like Jack took the opportunity to, like, in the you know, to, to take the time to be quiet, right? You know, tell the story in a slightly different manner. Like, it doesn't have to be wall-to-wall -wall dialogue. Gandhi repeatedly uses the landscape to frame the mood of the episode. The environment is observed before the characters enter it and either disrupt or pass through it. One thing that becomes immediately clear when studying Gendi's work is the variety of influences in his catalogue, particularly that of Akira Kurosawa, David Lean, and also the TV and comic influences ranging from Lone Wolf and Cub to Frank Miller's 300. For instance, take the scene of Samurai Jack. 
The slow focus on landscape and the world that exists allows us to focus attentively on where the characters will appear. By playing these shots out and focusing on the characters, waiting for the action to occur, the filmmaker can build anticipation. His imperative in any action is the anticipation. Anticipation is really telling the audience what is about to happen. Anticipation heightens the tension of a scene and is a common trope in many Western showdowns. They focus a lot on the eyes and other small motions on the periphery. Although the action may not last very long, our anticipation for that action puts us on the edge of our seat. So what I decided to do is to do things very slow, still with a good instinct to have it be you know, compelling and you're not bored. And then when things go fast, it goes crazy. Andy designs his action in a very controlled way. Let me explain. Action in Western animation of the 1990s and 2000s was dominated by a realistic style. Fluid motions that fed toward a character's final stance. Posing was considered of course, but the action was very slow, almost brutish. With Gendy, his spacing of the motion is far more concise. The posing is highlighted as keyframes, and then the in-betweens are sped up so our eyes register a longer held pose. This strong emphasis on a character's pose comes from the Tex Avery school of character movement. Hello, Joe. The pose is exaggerated to focus the audience on a moment in time that captures an idea. In Gendy's work, he holds onto the pose to allow us to register a precise action. My he spends a lot of time drawing multiple poses for a short period of action. And this is actually some of the choreography. So there's like 30, 40, 50 poses for like five seconds. <laughs> The animation style is basically very graphic, very line and shape oriented. In a, in a different type of uh, animated feature, we might have more natural gestures and things like that and move kind of like a human would. But with Gandhi, it's all about hitting a strong dynamic pose and kind of sitting on that until it becomes, uh, you know, time for the next move or whatever the, the scene needs. In 2D animation, lines are drawn and altered. But in 3D, the model is built and manipulated. In order to get the effect of a fast motion, animators add a motion blur to stitch the movement together. But this disrupts Gendy's expression of holding onto strong poses within the action. Our ImageWorks artists work to develop creative and technical methodologies that improve the look of a character's performance by mixing highly exaggerated poses with specifically calculated motion blur for important character moments. The lighting artist also rendered certain frames of Jonathan with less motion blur, carefully splicing these frames into the final composite where Gendy wanted a clearer read of the character's action. Adding those extra few frames of a still pose in between the arc of movement gives our eyes that extra moment to identify an action and allows us to either appreciate the caricatured action or appreciate the precision in the character's fighting. You can see Gendy's influence range across a variety of contemporary animation. See how they build anticipation. We are bonded forever. And briefly hold a strong pose between the flowing action. The anticipation built is always rewarded with action from Gendy, but often how he stitches the two together is just as interesting. 
For a lot of action directing, there are fast cuts that speed up the ferocity of a fight, but rarely take the time to build anticipation. Yendi has directly cited 70s cinema as having some of the biggest influences on his directing style. For instance, if we look at films like The Andromeda Strain or The Longest Yard, both of these features make interesting use of a panelling effect, similar to a comic book. Using this effect, we naturally follow each new panel as it appears, but it also lets us appreciate the montage of connected actions. In Gendy's work, as each new panel appears, the moment of the previous one is held, again emphasizing the character's pose. Playing with panelling and the aspect ratio, it focuses our attention into the core emotion and action of a scene, and also plays a direct parallel to the rigidly held long shots that build the anticipation. He uses a lot of static shots cut together to show an individual action and its consequences. We can almost follow what's happening in one of his scenes. So with these three story devices in mind, let's have a look at part of the opening scene from the fifth season of Samurai Jack. I think it clearly exudes each of Gendy's processes, from slow openings to strong posed movement, with a use of stylized editing that focuses our attention on each deliberate action. When I do one of these really slow pans, where it's just, you know, I get nervous, but I know I gotta, all I got is my instinct, you know, and if I don't trust it, that's like going through the whole feature process. That's all I had in fighting. It's just why it's in my gut, it feels wrong, and I've gotten this far on my gut. At some point, you gotta trust it, and I've made mistakes too, so you know along the way. So you have to believe in yourself, otherwise, you're gonna be running in circles. What Gendy interprets as his gut is an array of influences that have shaped the current style of movement in contemporary Western animation. He may not be aware of them, but his vision, shaped through inspiration, has dictated a decision until something feels right. I think this concept of readability is a defining feature of Gendy's work. Poses are held longer for us to take notice at the precise control of each emotion displayed. And coming back to the scene with Mace Windu in the Super Battle Droid, 
I think it shows Gendy's control and confidence in allowing us to read each beat of the action. Everything is framed clearly so we can see the action and he gives the movement time for us to understand exactly what occurred. Gendy lets the audience understand what is about to happen, what happens, and then we relax with the aftermath. I feel this kind of action oriented directing should be utilized more. A fight doesn't have to be a blur of motion with an ending. Take time to plan the beats so that when the movement begins, we drink in every second. And in fairness to Gendy, he's right about the action. It is pretty awesome.